In a typical directed evolution experiment, we begin with a specific gene sequence. We then apply random mutagenesis to this sequence to generate diversity and screen for variants with an improved property. We then repeat the experiment with these improved mutants. There are two common techniques for generating diversity, random mutagenesis or recombination of parental genes. These procedures typically involve PCR and then you subclone the library into a vector and transform your cells. You then pick individual colonies from the library, screen each one for activity, then cherry pick the winners with improved activity. And those mutants go back into the cycle. Let's look at an example from the early days of this type of experiment from Francis Arnold. During the synthesis of beta-lactam antibiotics, there is a difficult deprotection step that the authors wish to perform with an enzyme. They need the enzyme to hydrolyze this nitrobenzyl ester. Unfortunately, the chemical is sparingly soluble in water, so they must add DMF to the reaction mixture for it to go into solution. Unfortunately, the enzyme loses activity in the presence of DMF, so they want to improve the stability of their enzyme in DMF water mixtures. The specific reaction they want to perform is difficult to assay. Neither the starting material nor products are chromophores, so the only way to watch this reaction would be LCMS. For directed evolution, you typically need to assay around 10,000 variants to find useful uh, new mutants. A typical LCMS instrument takes 15 minutes per run, so this would be a very long project to do in that manner. So the experimentalists note that this enzyme will also catalyze the hydrolysis of, para of paranitrophenol esters, such as this acetate ester. Though it has one carbon less than the real substrate, it is structurally a very similar molecule and is also tolerated by the enzyme. The product, paranitrophenol, is yellow, so they can readily detect whether this reaction occurred without the need for cumbersome instruments. Experimentally, they begin with a plasmid encoding the PNB esterase. They then use a variation on your normal PCR protocol called aeroprone PCR to introduce point mutations throughout the gene at a rate of 1 to 5 mutations per gene. They then subclone the PCR products back into the plasmid and transform cells to make their library. They pick many individual colonies and then screen each one by placing the cells in a buffer containing the paranitrophenyl acetate substrate and DMF. They then quantify the yellow absorbance of each sample to get a score for the fitness of each variant. They then cherry pick out those clones showing improved activity and take them into another round of directed evolution. They perform five rounds of directed evolution. In the first round, they identify three improved mutants, and one of them was chosen as the template for the next round. So all variants in round two contain the mutations identified in round one. They identify three additional mutants, and again pick the best one to go into round three. In a final step, they combine all the beneficial mutations that were found in the previous constructs. With these mutants identified, they then perform more careful assays of their fitness and plot them out. Through the course of incremental mutation and screening, they generate mutants improved in their tolerance for DMF. They then look at the crystal structure of the protein to determine where these mutations lie. The big white blob in the middle of this protein is the substrate. The mutations identified in their screens are in yellow. Note that the mutations are quite far from the active site, and this is frequently the case. When screening for properties such as relaxation and substrate specificity, or improvements to folding, expression, thermal, or chemical stability, the mutations with increased fitness rarely are the ones that directly contact the substrate. Additionally, any mechanistic explanation of why these mutations improve chemical stability would require detailed energetic calculations about the structure. As of 2014, the computational tools still cannot reliably predict the sorts of mutations that come out of directed evolution studies, and rarely do mutations make any intuitive sense. When you introduce mutations into a protein coding sequence, the effect of the mutation on activity can be neutral, deleterious, or enabling. The extreme majority of amino acid substitutions have no effect on function. They are the same as wild type, and thus we call them neutral. That is around 90% of mutants. Around 9% of mutants are deleterious. Typically, mutations to the hydrophobic core will eliminate the ability to fold, 
and very often this 9% represents core mutations. Similarly, residues that directly contact the substrate or within the second shell around those residues are necessary for activity. Substitution to those sites have a deleterious effect on activity. It is the rare 1% of missense mutations that results in some altered activity such as improvement in thermostability or a change in substrate specificity. Thus, you must screen many mutants to identify those that are useful.